hello students so we are here again together for yet another interesting uh, session and today we'll be talking about a very common problem helminthiasis how common it is you will see uh, when we'll go through the presentation and that's why uh, the a mass campaign mode treatment is really needed for this major issue let's see what are the learning objectives for today so today we will be mainly dealing with the burden of major soil transmitted helminthiasis in india primarily we will be talking about soil transmitted helminthiasis what do we mean by soil transmitted means it is transmitted by contaminated soil the soil which is contaminated with eggs so that's why we call them soil transmitted helminthiasis so there are mainly four which we will be discussing Ascaris, that is the round worm, Ankylostoma, that is the hook worm, Trichuris, that is the whip worm, and Entrobius, which is called the pin worm. And then Tinea, yes, another group, because it is not a round worm, unlike the other four. It is a flat worm, but also it can be transmitted through the soil. Then we will outline the clinical features and get to know the complications of common helminthic uh, infection. We will limit to these major, these four only. And maybe at the end, we will give a passing remark to tinea because tinea in itself and um, subsequent neurocysticercosis is a different chapter altogether. I think we will deal that with the neurology or in some other section. Then we will uh, take you to the diagnosis and treatment of these common helminthiasis. And finally, we will discuss how uh, the community can get rid of this infection. Because you, you see, whenever we talk about the soil transmitted infections, the treatment consists of three parts. Number one, you have to have individual treatment. Number two, you have to have treatment of the community. And number three, you need to stress on the preventive aspects. So we will deal with all three individual treatment, community treatment and preventive aspects. So let's get started. First, uh, we told you that we will get to the burden of the infection globally and then we'll come to India. Let's see in the global uh, scenario what is the scene. As you can see in this pie chart, the major burden is again borne by this Ascaris. As you can see, almost 1000 million load that is by the Ascaris. The next common is the uh, hookworm and whipworm almost same. And then you have others. And another important one which we did not discuss in our context and we will not discuss much about this is Strongyloides stercorealis uh, because it is not a major problem in India. So we will not deal with this. We will deal as I said earlier with the other four organisms. So more than 1.5 billion, that means almost 25% of the earth population is infected with soil transmitted helminths. I don't know uh, whether there is any other uh, disease or any other infection that will be as common as this. So this is definitely a major problem. Most of them may be asymptomatic. Then many are mild, but there are very few who will be coming with symptoms. That is the tip of the iceberg. That is only the tip of the iceberg, but below the iceberg, below the level of the water lies the major population which is suffering from helminthic infections. Mainly uh, over 250 million preschool children and over 500 million school children are at risk. Now let's talk of the age. Mainly all three infections occur in mainly preschoolers and that, that is the Ascaris and the pinworm. But ankylostoma primarily occurs in children who are uh, walking, running in the school, going in the school, in the school age and adolescence. Hookworm is more common in the older age group, while all three are more common in the earlier age group between uh, 5 to 10 years of age. If you see the burden of helminthiasis in India, so 65% of soil transmitted infections occurring in all of Southeast Asia occur in India. So that is the burden in India. India also accounts 
for almost one fourth that is 27 percent of the global cases of soil transmitted helminthiasis. Almost 200 million preschool and school aged children are affected. Now, what is the prevalence of helminthiasis in children in India? There are various estimates. Let us see the global uh, atlas, what does it say? It says that India overall, when we talk about India as a whole, there is more than 20 percent prevalence that comes in the moderate prevalence zone. And there are various studies are available which says, which are conducted by Ministry of Health Family Welfare, conducted by National Center for Disease Control and the prevalence of these warm infestations, these helminthiasis lie anywhere between 12.5 to 85 percent. So, there is a very, very wide range depending on the rural or urban scenario, depending on the season, depending on the climates of the area, depending on other factors, we will discuss about them. The prevalence uh, differs a lot. But when we talk about an overall prevalence, let us say we take around, it is more than 20 percent prevalence in the Indian scenario. Why so much concern? It is okay. How does it matter if one fourth of the world population and uh, is infected and they are not having much problem. Why are you concerned? There, there is definite concern because most of the infections are mostly mild and asymptomatic. But that does not mean that it is not causing any problems. Most of the worms, whenever they live in your body, they are not harmless. They eat a portion of what you should be using or what you should be utilizing for your metabolism. So, obviously, they deprive you of very major nutrients. So, that is one of the major reasons this may cause chronic problems such as stunting, which is never recognized that it is because of a warm infestation. Moderate to heavy infections, obviously, they result in growth faltering. There is nutritional compromise, mainly fat uh, metabolism and subsequently hypoalbuminemia also they cause. Anemia is a major problem. Anemia occurs either because of the malabsorption of iron or mainly as you know in the hookworm especially that is the ankylostoma, they have teeth and they have, uh, they adhere to the, to the wall of the intestine and cause erosions in the intestinal wall and from there the bleeding occurs. So, common, we will get to know the clinical features of each of these infections subsequently. Then they also lead to suboptimal academic performance because uh, a child who is having a heavy moderate to heavy load always usually have a pain abdomen and parents do not know and most of the time the, they will miss the school or will not be interested in studying. So, this also leads to this is a major concern also when we are talking about worm infestation. Coming to the disability in the terms of morbidity. Disability adjusted life years, you must have heard of that concept daily. So, the daily loss are more than 22 million for hookworm, more than 10 million for ascariasis, and more than 6 million for trichuris. This is just for records, thus, you should know that these are the this is the major burden not only by the infection, but it also causes the some loss of disability adjusted life years. Again, going through an overview of an uh, helminths. Let us see how do we classify. Helminths are, can be classified overall into round or flat. The round ones are known as nemet helminthis and the flat ones are known as plati helminthis. In the plati helminthis mainly we will discuss tenia or tapeworm. Why do we call it tapeworm? Because it, it, it is flat and it uh, runs like a tape in a tape and with the fragments in between, these are the segments, proglotted segment. So, that is why we call it a tapeworm. Roundworms together, it is a, it's a big bunch. But when we say roundworm, in particular, we always mean only Ascaris uh, as a roundworm because it, it is round in shape and it is very clearly visible. So, for a, for a layman also, for a medical practitioner also, for a student also, whenever we say roundworm, so, we refer to Ascaris. Then we have hookworm, that is the ankylostoma, 
duodenal, ankylostoma duodenals, and uh, we have Nicator americana. So, these are the hookworms and basically because why they are known as hookworm? As I told you, because their buccal cavity possesses uh, hooks or teeth through which they attach to the intestinal mucosa. That is why they are known as hookworm. And then uh, Trichuris trichura, whipworm, because they resemble, their shape resembles a whip. Uh, that is why they are known as Trichuris trichura. And Antrobius vermicularis are known as pinworms because they are very small size, the size of a uh, pin, you can say 0.5 to 1 centimeter size. So, they are known as pinworms. And finally, you have Strongyloids stercorellis. I think because they are not that common, so they do not carry a nickname like the others have. And we will discuss, therefore, all these four uh, in detail with their different nicknames. So, you should be very clear which one is which. I repeat, Ascaris is a roundworm, Ankylostoma is hookworm, Antrobius is pinworm, and Trichuris is whipworm. Good. So, let us see what are the risk factors. It is very simple to remember risk factors. Wherever there is a contact with the contaminated soil, the risk will be there. This contact with the contaminated soil may be because you are washing, walking barefoot in the soil. Maybe you are washing your hands with the soil. Maybe your hands are contaminated with soil and you are eating without washing your hands. Maybe you are taking a water supply which is contaminated with soil. Or maybe you are living in such conditions where there is obvious uh, soil contamination into the environment of the house, into the utensils and uh, you are eating with bare hands without washing hands properly. You are doing open air defecation is being done because when you do open air defecation, all the eggs, whatever they pass out of the gastrointestinal tract, they are deposited in the soil. In the soil, they hatch and from that soil, through anything they can get into the another host. They can get into another host by uh, through the transdermal penetration like in ankylosoma or they can uh, follow a fecooral route. So, we will talk about the life cycle when we come to the next slide. As you can see, there is a report from Bihar uh, which has a very high prevalence of uh, soil transmitted infection in children to the tune of 68 percent and this study found that majority of children that were having these infection, 95 percent of them were practicing open defecation and they were reporting cleansing the hands after defecation with soil. So, these were the major factors in a state which was having a very high prevalence of uh, soil transmitted helminthiasis. Where do they live? They have a very good relationship between themselves. That is very important. So, they do not disturb each other. They have their own sanctuaries for living. Okay, so like ankylostoma lives in duodenum and jejunum. Ascaris prefers to stay in the small intestine ahead of jejunum. Trichuris remains in large intestine and cecum. And finally, Enterobius prefers the last part of the gastrointestinal tract uh, that is the colon and rectum because a female Enterobius uh, does not prefer to lay eggs within the body. The female Antrobius is like a tigress who ventures out at night and sleeps in the day. So, the female Antrobius goes out in night out of the colon and rectum to the perianal skin, lays the eggs there and then come back. So, so the, this is the, that is why Antrobius are uh, in the colon and rectum. I hope you will remember that. Simply uh, Ankylostoma duodenal, so the, it remains in duodenum. Ascaris small intestine, whipworm, uh, that is the trichuris in large intestine and Antrobius in colon and rectum. And they have corresponding symptoms. The symptoms not only, but remember, the symptoms not only depend on where they live, the symptoms also depend on what all route they take when they are inside the body. Like if some worm only travels through the gastrointestinal tract, it will mainly have GIT symptoms. There are worms which follow the pulmonary migration 
so they will also have pulmonary symptoms they may also have pulmonary symptoms and like entrobius i said mainly because it is in colon and rectum so perianal itching whenever it occurs we ascribe it to entrobius the others will not cause perianal itching so we'll come to the clinical features as we go further in this presentation life cycle of soil transmitted helminths of any worm it is very important to understand uh, the life cycle life cycle means where do they live how do they live uh, how do they go out of the human body how do they affect the human body again and what do they do inter in the intermediate period when they are not in the human body and in the human body where all they can go what is the potential of their transmission to the various organs of human body so if we broadly advise, uh, broadly divide the transmission mainly is feco oral and then transdermal if say feco oral so uh, all the worms have a feco oral transmission except the ankylostoma which is which comes into the human body by penetrating the skin so hookworms enter the human body by penetrating the skin they have a transdermal penetration while all others the trichuris the entrobius and ascaris they enter the skin through feco oral route or you can say through the oral route so they enter uh, through the oral route now simple two worms follow simple feco oral cycle the first to the whip worm and the pin worm means simply you eat an infected or you ingest an infected the egg goes to the intestine or uh, wherever it lives hatches there adults are liberated the eggs are again laid and then eggs are passed in the feces and again from feces they through the soil transmitted they are again transmitted they maybe they hatch in the soil or they uh, mature in the soil for some time depending on which worm is it there are different times of maturation in the soil and they can again infect the host but so this is known as a simple feco oral route or simple feco oral cycle so two of these worms uh, they make our life easy they don't have much uh, luxury and they are their simple poor uh, worms who enjoy only a feco oral cycle now there are two worms which are uh, more complex which live a more complex and uh, luxurious uh, lifestyle because they go to the various uh, organs uh, also and primarily lung is the one where these worms or the larvae of these worms go what are these two uh, worms ascaris and ankylostoma that is a round worm and the hook worm so ascaris and I told you typically ankylostoma enters through the skin, and somehow we will come to through the circulation. It goes to the lungs first, and from lungs the further life cycle starts. Ascaris, on the other hand, it enters the eggs are ingested through the oral route, and from the portal circulation, these are taken. Uh, the larvae hatch in the intestine in the jejunum and from there through the portal circulation they are taken into the lungs so from the lungs again they come into the git and then they are grow uh, into an adult so it's a it's a little bit complex cycle for mainly for ascaris and hookworm we will go into the life cycle of each of the uh, these worms one by one interestingly helminths cannot reproduce within the host cannot multiply within the host but yes that what does that mean that means the intensity of infection is proportional to the amount of eggs the person ingests the more heavily infected will have more heavy infections in their intestine now let's discuss the some of the features uh, let's see what these worms look like what their eggs uh, look like ascaris um, i i am sure all those who are working in pediatrics must have seen at some time or other we used to see loads of ascaris being either coughed out 
or being either passed in uh, feces uh, almost uh, every week in some of the other child. The problem is still common and those who are working in medical colleges in uh, rural India or the suburban India, they will find it more often. So, the female is uh, longer than the male as you can see and it is, as we said, it is a most common helminthic infection in school age and preschool age children uh, and also more common because all of us can see these worms and one can relate with these worms very easily. Now, let us see the life cycle of Ascaris. If we see the life cycle of Ascaris, let us say we start from where they are ingested. So, a person or a child ingests embryonated eggs. Let us say we start from here. These embryonated eggs come down and they are ingested and they go down the gastrointestinal tract and here in the intestine, these hatch into larvae. These larvae enter the portal circulation and from here they migrate to the lungs. Now, let us have a look into the life cycle of Ascaris. As I said, this is the most complex life cycle amongst all the uh, soil transmitted helminths. So, we will go slowly, try to understand this because if you are clear in the life cycle, you will understand all the clinical features complications and also the treatment becomes easier. Let us say we start from here. The embryonated eggs are ingested by the child and then these travel down the gastrointestinal tract into the stomach and from stomach into the intestine where they hatch and larvae are emerge out of the eggs. These larvae enter the portal circulation. You can see this is the hatched larvae just showing, uh, being shown in this outset. And uh, from here they enter the portal circulation and through the portal circulation they go and enter the lungs. In the lungs, from the lungs, these larvae are coughed up. They cough up through the trachea, they migrate up through the trachea and then they come into the uh, oropharynx and then they are swallowed again. So, when they are swallowed, they again re-enter the gastrointestinal tract and guest, again they go in this larvae and now these larvae and again go the same way and they then come to reside in the small intestine and that is where their further maturation proceeds. So, adults reside in the small intestine. We have always said this is the female, the longer one and the male, the shorter one. And then they reside in the small intestine and then where they produce eggs and the eggs are excreted into feces. Two types of eggs are produced. One are unfertilized eggs. They will not go undergo further development. Then you have the fertilized eggs and these fertilized eggs will undergo development, further development in the soil. And they are, they develop and again, they become uh, various stages are produced and then you have a embryonated egg finally with L3 stage larvae. And these are the egg larvae eggs which are again, when they are again ingested, then they will cause the same cycle will be repeated. So, I hope we are clear about the life cycle of the Ascaris. I will repeat once more uh, so that uh, it is clear. Eggs are ingested, embryonated eggs are ingested. They travel down into the intestine where they hatch into larvae. These larvae through portal circulation go into the lungs. From lungs, these larvae are coughed up and then they are swallowed back into the gastrointestinal tract again. The larvae come to lie in the small intestine where they grow up as adults. There, the eggs are laid and these eggs are passed into the faces. These eggs then undergo maturation in the soil and finally, when they are again embryonated at a particular stage, when they are again ingested, then this will again cause an infection in a new host. So, I hope we are clear about the life cycle. Now, let us see uh, what does this, that means mainly if we talk about clinical features, where all can clinical features occur. So, clinical features can occur in the lungs when they are migrating through the lungs. 
so clinical feature can occur in the lungs clinical features can occur in the intestine so these are the two main and then there can be other features let's see what are the different clinical features that can happen uh, this is just showing that uh, these eggs may go inside with contaminated fruit, vegetable, maybe water or other, anything which is contaminated with soil. In the lungs, what they cause is known as Loeffler syndrome. I hope you are all aware of what Loeffler syndrome is. It's mainly a hypersensitivity phenomena. So, a hypersensitivity pneumonia, there is sudden onset wheezing, dyspnea, there is paroxysmal non productive cough and fever and you find uh, eosinophilia is a characteristic hallmark of the Loeffler syndrome or whenever the pulmonary migration of the uh, larvae occur. Intestinal ascariasis, uh, intestinal ascariasis you can see you, it can cause abdominal pain, nausea and episodic diarrhea, heavy loads. Heavy loads can cause gut obstruction and hepatobiliary complications. So, not only it can cause intestinal obstruction, it can go into the biliary tract also. Larvae and in adult and uh, the worms have been identified in the, not only in the gallbladder, but in the biliary, complete biliary tract and it can obstruct the biliary tract as well as the intestine. So, this was about the ankylostoma. These were the major issues that can occur with ascaris and as we know ascaris has all also been associated with a kind of encephalopathy. Uh, we used to uh, read earlier days and it, it is also described in the older books that ascaris produces a toxin called ascarin and then it, it has the potential to cause encephalopathy and a terminology uh, as warm encephalopathy was also known. Uh, now, nowadays we rarely see these kind of cases. Coming to the hookworm, that is the Necator americanus and Ankylostoma duodenale. Ankylostoma had several species. Duodenale is one of them which is the most uh, common. Again, the females are longer than the males, uh, hardly one centimeter is the length. So, they are not only uh, tapeworm that is tenia and the roundworm that is ascaris are huge. Huge in the sense that yes, everybody can see and recognize their presence. As I said, this is maximum anemia causes potential. Now, if you see the ankylostoma duodenale, now you can see this is a histological section which is it shows it is attached to the intestine. How does it get attached to the intestine through its teeth? This is the nicator and this is the ankylostoma duodenale. So, they feed on the gut mucosal blood supply. They suck the supply, they suck the blood as well as they cause erosions in the gut. When they cause erosions in the gut, there is bleeding from that particular side. So, not only the blood is lost through sucking, but the blood is also lost through those erosions and sometimes even frank gastrointestinal blood loss can occur. How much blood loss one hookworm causes? Remember your parasitology, microbiology days. 0.03 ml to 0.15 ml per worm per day. This appears so minuscule, but they are not there in single. They are there in uh, hundreds and maybe more than that. So, so it, it's, it's a heavy load and it's a heavy uh, blood loss that results in not only anemia, this also results in um, hypoalbuminemia, this also results in uh, chronic malabsorption, so many problems are associated. Let us see the life cycle of uh, ankylostoma. As I said, uh, this is a, let us say where do they enter from? Again, they usually the larvae penetrate the skin when you are walking barefoot in the fields or when you are uh, going for open field defecation, that is the most common or uh, in the rural areas, if the you do not wear shoes, uh, then they can enter through the, uh, usually they enter through the feet, penetrate the skin from the circulation, then they go to the lungs, larvae exit the circulation in the lung and from the lung, these larvae are again cuffed up and swallowed and then when they come, they swallow, they come to reside and they become dormant 
in the small intestine that means duodenum and jejunum primarily the first part of the small intestine and that's where they usually lie so adults lie in the part of the duodenum and the uh, upper part of the small intestine that is the jejunum so you can have ankylostoma duodenale ankylostoma selanicum and nicator americanus these are the few important species that uh, the hookworm has and finally the eggs are laid there and then eggs are again passed in the feces and they have a maturation uh, phase in the soil where the larvae hatches and after them the larvae they enter the skin again as we told earlier. So this is the life cycle of uh, ankylostoma. Now if you just look at the life cycle of ankylostoma, uh, where all the symptoms can occur, symptoms obviously you it is very easy now, the symptoms can occur in the intestine because the adults lie in the intestine and the symptoms can occur in the at the in the lungs because they migrate through the lungs and symptoms can occur in the skin because they enter through the skin. So I hope I am clear. The symptom, major symptoms can be there in the skin, major symptom can be there in the lungs and major symptoms can be there in the uh, small intestine. Now, let us see what are these symptoms are. In the skin, you can have ground itch. That means there is intense itching right is at the site of their entrance and alongside the, the path they take to migrate. It can go into the skin and it can cause a cutaneous larva migraines. Uh, that is a typical skin manifestation of hookworm. Lung involvement again can result into Loeffler syndrome, sign symptoms similar to what you have in ascariasis. Again, you can have wheezing, dyspnea, and then you have uh, eosinophilia associated. And in the intestine, again, abdominal pain uh, will be the major symptom in acute stage, while in the chronic stage, it will result in anemia. We have already talked about how much blood loss a single hookworm can cause in a day. And there are multiples of them. So, they, they result in huge, that is a major cause of iron deficiency anemia in school going children and uh, adolescents uh, beside the other causes. So, these are the various uh, manifestations of uh, hookworm, major manifestations I talked about. Uh, but they all can cause systemic manifestation also, mind you. They can cause uh, prolonged fever, they can cause failure to thrive, they all the worms can cause malabsorption and that itself may lead to several other issues. And usually when they are associated with other co-infections also, remember this is very important. When a child comes to you with some other illness, primarily from a rural background, so it is quite common that almost 25 to 30 percent of them will be carrying worm infestation as well. So, always look for worm infestation and treat it if you are suspecting it on the basis of clinically and if confirmed uh, by stool examination, uh, very good. But even if not, uh, we will talk about the community treatment that is being given on the presumptive basis in areas with moderate to high transmission. Coming to the next worm, Trichuris trichura, whip worm. Again, they are shaped like a whip. So, that is why you can see the, the whip of a male and female. Again, the females are uh, a bit longer than the males and their typical uh, whip. They have a typical egg. This is a barrel shaped egg. You can see there is a polar plug at both the ends. So, these are the eggs of the trichuris and this is the shape whip. Uh, the male is coiled. Uh, vertically and the female is a comma shaped worm. As I said, whip worm and pin worm make our life easier because they have a simpler life cycle, simpler lifestyle you can say and thus a simpler life uh, cycle. The eggs are ingested, embryonated eggs are ingested. They do not go here, there, everywhere. They simply come and lie and in the uh, intestine, in the small intestine and uh, then adults reside, larvae hatch in the small intestine, but adults go to the large intestine and reside in the cecum. And there they lay eggs and eggs are passed in the feces again and this again gets matured outside the human body and finally when you have the 
eggs are embryonated, they can again infect a fresh human being. So, this is a simple life cycle of, a, uh, of the whip worm. I, I ask you a question, just think, what all symptoms or what is the major symptom that these will cause? So, these are symptoms, all, uh, this will, uh, where do they reside? Primarily, they reside in the large intestine and cecum. And the major problem they can cause there is the dysentery, which is typically known as trichuris dysentery syndrome. So, they can cause colitis and severe pain abdomen and trichuris dysentery syndrome. And it is a typically, this dysentery is associated with tenesma, straining, perforation and rectal prolapse. In fact, whenever you have rectal prolapse, associated with the dysentery and associated with clubbing. So, this triad always think of a trichuris infection. And this dysentery is, is difficult. Suppose your child is having dysentery, you have treated for um, bacillary dysentery, you, shigella, you have treated for amoebic dysentery and still the problem is not being resolved. Always think of trichuris because it can cause uh, some uh, dysentery which is usually unresolving and unyielding to the common modes of treatment. Coming to the fourth one, that is the anterobius or the pinworm. Uh, it is, they are white round adults, simple people, simple lifestyle, 0.5 to 1 centimeter length, classical bean shaped eggs, as you can see the shape of the egg, classical bean shaped eggs. And uh, this is a specific worm which can cause auto infection. This is the only worm rather which is uh, which is infamous for causing auto infection. Once you lay eggs, the eggs are laid and then they can again get into the body and they cause infection because the time that is required for their maturation inside the eggs is hardly 4 to 6 hours. So, in the other, the time required is larger, so it, it does not cause auto infection. So, simply embryonated eggs are ingested by humans, larvae hatch in the small intestine, finally they go through the small intestine, large intestine and they reside in the rectum area and in the lumen of cecum and rectum and in the night as I said the gravid female uh, ventures out into the perianal area, lays the eggs there, that is why you have perianal itching during the night and it comes back and the eggs are deposited there. So, mostly when we go for the diagnosis of uh, anterobius, we may not find anterobius eggs in the stool, but that means their eggs have to be picked up from the perianal area. So, either you take a swab from the perianal area or you do that scotch, uh, the cello tape test where you uh, apply a tape on the perianal area and then the eggs stick to it and then you uh, look them for under the microscope. So, this is the typical life cycle of anterobius uh, vermicularis or the pinworm. The major symptom is perianal itching during the night. Uh, there is pruritus and eye, irritability and sleeplessness. Uh, one of the major um, parents would come to you most many times that the child clatters his or her teeth during the night. That is known as bruxism and they ascribe it traditionally to worm infestation. Uh, there is no scientific uh, evidence to this, but sometimes they are correct because as I said, almost one fourth of the children are infected with the worms in any particular case. This is important, the anterobius does not cause much problem other than um, anal itching uh, when it is in the gastrointestinal intestinal tract. But this uh, anterobius or pinworms can migrate to ectopic sites and it can cause appendicitis, chronic salpingitis, pelvic inflammatory disease, even peritonitis, hepatitis and extra intestinal granuloma. So, those these complications are rare, but yes, one should keep these in mind as well. Coming to the uh, last, we will not, uh, the tenia or the tape worm, we will not take uh, much time here. As we all know, it uh, they are Tinea saginata and Tinea solium are the main species that infect humans. Saginata is also known as beef tape, tapeworm and Tinea is also known as pork tapeworm because they infect different, uh, these are the different hosts that are uh, infected in the intermediary cycle. But remember, 
it does not mean it gives an impression that only by eating beef or only by eating pork you can get a tinea infection which is a misleading uh, myth nowadays most of the time as you already you must be seeing whenever see so many children with neurocystic sarcosis and neurocystic sarcosis mainly is has been observed now in vegetarian children in vegetarian communities because not only it transmitted through the beef and the pork it is mainly transmitted with the vegetables which are unwashed especially cabbage has a very high potential of carrying the neuro uh, the cystic sarcoi and if unwashed because it gets rolled down into the leaves of the cabbage and uh, if the cabbage is not washed properly it is not uh, washed thoroughly then it has the highest potential of causing uh, the tinea infection and subsequently uh, teniasis or uh, cystic sarcosis in the human being the life cycle i'll not go into the detail because it's a, there is a, another host involved which can be usually the pig or the uh, other animals and where uh, you see the the eggs or the gravid uh, even the eggs are laid in the feces or the gravid proglottids that means these segments are known of the tapeworm each segment is Uh, known as proglottid as i said it looks like a tape divided into several segments and each segment can uh, get off and it can serve as a uh, in feces and they are passed into the environment so these proglottid by itself or the embryonic egg both have the potential to be ingested by the intermediate host and then the intermediate host the hatching occurs and again or these eggs or gravid proglottid they can either infect a intermediate host or they can directly infect the another human being and from there the eggs can directly go to any organ in the body if they end up in the brain they end up as neurocystis sarcoi cystis sarcoi are the eggs they have been noticed in each and every part of the body and it is difficult to treat uh, some of them in some situation we will not go into the details of treatment of cystis sarcosis or neurocystis sarcosis because it's a different subject altogether and maybe you can read it in the neurology section or we may have a, another video in it whenever the time uh, permits the major adults again lie in the small intestine Uh, as i said this is not universal it says raw or undercooked meat containing larval cyst so it's not only meat remember that even the vegetables rather vegetables infected vegetables are more common than meat nowadays which carry this larval cyst this infection may cause pain abdomen unexpected weight loss and heavy loads may cause intestinal obstruction neurocystis sarcosis most common presentation of neurocystis sarcosis that comes to us is unprovoked convulsion in children the coming to the diagnosis simple uh, the diagnosis though we have written it differently but diagnosis is almost similar you diagnose it through the presence of either you can see the worm that is the uh, and you can see the ascaris being expelled in the Uh, from the gi tract or being expelled in the, from the pulmonary circulation you can see uh, the flat worm that is the tape worm and or you can microscopically see the eggs of these uh, particular worms in ascaris also you can have macroscopic identification adults in stool and vomitus larval worms can be detected in sputum stool microscopy will show the characteristics eggs and eosinophilia eosinophilia is a marker of that the worm has migrated through the lungs and it is a part of that hypersensitivity phenomena which occurs during the migration of the worm in the lungs diagnosis of hookworm again by demonstrating typical eggs in the stool serology is not that reliable pcr um uh, is upcoming but it is not available in most of the laboratories and no one would want to go for pcr for such an infection which is so common and almost there in almost one fourth of the children in india so again uh, typical presence of typical eggs whenever you doing stool examination for a particular worm remember that take at least three samples on three consecutive days otherwise you may miss it you cannot say in a single sample whether the stool uh, has this infection the eggs or not 
and uh, again the hookworm uh, eggs are very uh, they, you can say they are fragile they get lysed very easily so the uh, their time if the stool sample stands for too long you may not find hookworm eggs in the stool entrobius i said this is typical because here in the entrobius you may not find worms in the stool but for getting the or you may not find eggs in the stool but for getting the eggs you will have to have a swab of the perianal area to pick up the eggs or you just apply a scotch a tape over the perianal area in the morning because the eggs are laid in the night and then you uh, just uh, take off this tape and on the tape the eggs are deposited and these eggs again you can scrape this on a slide and then you can see it under a microscope so this is the diagnosis of uh, enterobius coming to the whip worm trichuris infection again the stool microscopy as i said typical eggs barrel shaped eggs are there with the polar plugs on both the sides once again demonstrating these polar plugs and in the uh, if uh, uh, sometimes you may have to do a colonoscopy and uh, there you find a thread like worms and a typical coconut cake rectum appearance uh, is uh, seen whenever there is severe dysentery coming to the treatment we will be talking about two main categories of drug. There are two types of treatment are available. One type of drugs that, that starve the worm. They deprive the worm of their food and by starvation the worm dies. So that is one type of treatment. The second type of treatment is you paralyze the worm. The worm, how can you paralyze somebody? You can paralyze, we know there are two kinds of paralysis. One is a spastic paralysis and one is a flaccid paralysis. So, there are both kinds of drugs. You paralyze the worm, the worm doesn't move, the worm lies inert. And then they lie there, but then you will need a laxative to push them out of the body. So, that is the second approach of treatment of worm infestation. So, let's see what are the drugs for each group uh, that causes these action. These are drugs mebendazole, albendazole the most commonly used drugs, these are known as beta tubulin binder drugs. What, what do they do? They are in the first category, they starve the worm. So, how do they do that? They bind to the beta tubulin structure of the worm and this beta tubulin, they inhibit microtubule formation. By doing this, they do two things. They disrupt the skeleton of the worm it is not the bony skeleton, obviously. It is a cytoskeleton of the worm. So, they disrupt the cytoskeleton of the worm and they also cause poor intestinal glucose uptake. So, the worm does not get the required energy or the glucose for its uh, survival. And finally, it results in starvation of worm and the worm dies. So, this is the mechanism of action of albendazole or mebendazole, which are the most commonly used drugs. And even when we talk about community treatment, uh, albendazole is the most preferred drug. And remember, albendazole has another advantage. It is larvicidal as well as ovicidal as well. I hope you understand. It not only kills the adult worm, but it takes care of the ova, that is the eggs, and it takes care of the larvae as well. While all the other drugs are primarily, they are geared to the destruction or expulsion of the worm from the body. So, now let us talk about the second group of drugs. These are the paralytic agents. As I said earlier, the paralytic agents may work as a spastic paralytic agent or a flaccid paralytic agent. The typical example of a spastic paralytic agent is parental pamoid and levamizole and flaccid paralysis is piperazine. So, now they have different mechanism of action. Of course, the spastic paralysis is caused because it, they are the, these drugs are nicotinic acetylcholine receptor agonist and the uh, flaccid paralysis agent that is piperazine is a GABA agonist. Finally, they result in paralysis uh, of worm and when, uh, so the worm may get expelled by itself, by the intestinal, normal intestinal uh, motility or if you can aid that expulsion by adding a laxative, the worms can even be uh, expelled by that. So, most of the time the worms are expelled uh, alive during this process and they are not dead because they are just paralyzed and not dead. 
coming to the other drugs, we will talk mainly about the two drugs. One is ivermectin and the second is netazoxanide. Ivermectin uh, is cannot be used for children less than 15 kg. Remember, it's not a routine drug for treatment of worm infestation. The second drug is uh, netazoxanide, which is usually used for treatment of let's say cryptosporidiasis and uh, maybe other uh, uh, amoebic infections, but here it can also be used for treatment of helminthiasis. Let's see the individual treatment of each infection. Ascariasis, I will not uh, read out the doses, you know them well or you can read them later in the notes section in the presentation. You can use albendazole, single dose, either 400 milligram or 200 milligram if you are using in children below 2 years of age. Mebendazole, one uh, tablet or 100 milligram twice a day for 3 days or 500 milligram once. Ivermectin, piprazine citrate, nitazoxanide. So, these are the various options for treatment of Ascariasis. And then you may have to resort to surgery if there is a severe obstruction which is resulting in intestinal obstruction. Hookworm, again the drugs remain same, primarily albendazole or mebendazole. The dosages are also uh, same albendazole single dose and mebendazole 100 milligram twice a day for 3 days. Antrobius, again the albendazole, you see they, they are almost similar drugs. Uh, the only is that albendazole 400 milligram you can repeat at 2 weeks. Mebendazole again uh, 100 twice a day for 3 days and then parental palmoate is another option. And for trituaries uh, you have albendazole again or mebendazole. So, drugs are um, uh, the same most common drug that we use are albendazole or mebendazole that is the uh, beta tubulin uh, drugs which starve the worm and they are the most effective also. Let us see the cure rate with different treatment, ankylostoma, specifically hookworm, single dose mebendazole, high failure rate. So, do not use single dose mebendazole, that is the 500 milligram once only for ankylostoma. Two doses of albendazole given two weeks apart, 92 percent cure rate. Ascariasis, single dose albendazole, 85 percent cure rate. Trichura, single dose albendazole and single dose mebendazole, only 30 to 40 percent cure rate. What does that mean? Trichuris is, is really difficult to treat with this. So, single dose albendazole, single dose mebendazole may not work specifically in trichura infection, which causes uh, colitis or dysentery like syndrome. So, what is recommended for trichura? You can go for combination chemotherapy. The combination chemotherapy would consist of combination of palmate or albendazole and ivermectin or albendazole. So, use albendazole with another drug. So, that may result in better cure rates when we are talking about the whipworm infections. Treatment of tenesis. Uh, you can just see on one side there is there is a multiple uh, cysticercae there in the brain. Uh, remember multiple cysticercae, we do not give anti-cysticercal drug and you will, uh, so read more about it, neurocysticercosis and its treatment uh, in the related chapter. The diagnosis is again made by presence of uh, gravid uh, proglottids or uh, eggs in the stool. Uh, treatment of intestinal teniasis, the drug of choice are either praziquintal, niclosamide or albendazole. So, these are the three drugs which can be used for treatment of intestinal teniasis. When we are talking about the neurocysticercosis, the drug of choice is only albendazole. So, what are the indication of treatment of neurocysticercosis and in which uh, condition? Uh, I think again you will have to go to the related slide. But remember, the drugs for intestinal teniasis, praziquintal, niclosamide, and albendazole. Now, as I said in the very beginning, uh, you have three facets to the treatment or the management of the soil transmitted uh, helminthiasis. Individual treatment we have already discussed. So, again we found mebendazole or albendazole are the most important drugs in that segment. Second is the community treatment and third is the prevention. So, now what we will discuss is the community treatment. Uh, under the Anemia Mukt Bharat program, India has been observing a national dewarming day and uh, 
uh, all the children in a particular area are given uh, these uh, albendazole uh, so, and these are given once a year if the prevalence is more than 20 percent and in areas where the prevalence is uh, if the prevalence is let's say 20 to between 20 to 50 percent so we give once a year albendazole to all children in the community and if the prevalence is more than 50 percent then you give twice a year albendazole in the community. So this is the dosage schedule. How much dose is given? Between 1 to 2 years, it is half tablet that means only 200 milligram of albendazole and between older children you give a full tablet. And these are the chewable tablets that are distributed for the national uh, during the national dewarming day. Preventive chemotherapy as I said earlier, we disc uh, discussed this in the lights, last slide also. In high risk area, we classify the area by the uh, percent prevalence of a warm load in that particular area. If the prevalence is more than 50 percent, we say it is a high risk area. If it is between 20 percent to 50 percent, we call it a moderate risk area and less than 20 percent, we call a uh, low risk area. In low risk area, community treatment is not recommended. 20 to 50 percent moderate risk area annually deworming is recommended and in high load area more than 50 percent. Uh, so you need to have know the prevalence in the various regions. As I said India overall has a prevalence overall on an average between 20 to 50 percent. But there are so many regions in India where the prevalence is more than 50 percent and in those areas you will need to give twice a year uh, treatment for community treatment for worm infestation. Third, you can say the pillar of uh, management is the prevention and the most important obviously, I hope you remember this acronym, WASH, which stands for water, sanitation and hygiene. So water, sanitation and hygiene, in a study this was published. Uh, many studies have now established that wash access to proper portable water, access to sanitation and access to hygiene reduced the soil transmitted infection in at least 33 percent odds of infection in, in a recent meta-analysis. That is what all Swachh Bharat Abhiyan is also all about, uh, the provision of portable water and reduction or in the uh, in the total helminthus load by providing water sanitation and hygiene facilities at the doorstep but a few important message do not defecate in the open number 1 keep your surroundings clean always drink clean water and keep the food covered wear shoes while walking especially in the fields and when the feet are coming in contact with the soil wash your hands with soap especially before eating and after using the toilet and then wash fruit and vegetable with clean water. Plenty of running water, wash all the fruit and vegetable and keep your nails clean and short. So simple preventive messages will help get rid of these infections. Coming to the global targets 2030, there are six uh, targets for soil transmitted helminthiasis. So achieve elimination of all soil transmitted helminthic morbidity in preschool and school age children. So we aim, the global aim is to achieve the elimination of STH in preschool and school age children by 2030, reduce the number of tablets needed for preventive chemotherapy uh, and then establish efficient uh, control program in uh, for adolescents and also for pregnant and lactating women and also ensure universal access. I think this is the most important one, ensure universal access to at least basic sanitation and hygiene by 2030 in STH endemic areas. So dear friends, this was about an overview of helminthiasis, typically soil infected helminthiasis uh, in children. And we mainly today discussed about four major helminthic infections that is the roundworm or ascariasis. We also discussed about hookworm or ankylostoma and whipworm trichuris 
and the pinworm that is the anterobius. We discuss their clinical feature, treatment, individual treatment, community treatment and prevention uh, methodology. So I hope that you like this lecture and you will be benefited by this and you can go again and again in, uh, remember remember the life cycle of these worms the one important tip if you can remember the life cycle the rest everything will automatically fall in place what are the clinical features how to treat when to treat where to treat and how to take preventive measures thank you thank you very much for paying your kind attention